But what was very disturbing was the disrespect that was so blatant. I would be sitting in meetings initially, because you know, as a doctor, you're always a doctor no matter where you are. And I thought it was really quite humorous sitting with all these big diplomats and here I am a medical doctor and I'm supposed to be useful. But every now and then somebody will say something and I'm like, wait just a minute, did he just say that? You know? And one particular event, there was a whole team of African ministers and one particular leader of a particular department in Washington started raising their voice and screaming and yelling at them. You Africans, you will never speak with one voice. This document over here is gonna be a piece of paper 20 years from now. I said, okay, so we can all be ministers here. Somebody say something. It wasn't my show. I was like third, you know how you sit, you got your team leader, and then according to rank, I was number three. So clearly I wasn't supposed to speak. I waited for those who were supposed to speak. Hello, my good people, and of course, I am your brother Fred from Africa. Welcome back again to our channel. Now, today I want us to watch some video here by Dr. Arikana. You know, uh, Dr. Arikana, Dr. Arikana Chihombori is a, a medical doctor and a, an activist. She is a public speaker, an educator, diplomat, founder of medical clinics, and an entrepreneur. She moves to the United States after living many years in Zimbabwe. She is the CEO and founder of Bell Family Medical Centers in the United States and served as the African Union representatives to the United States from 2017 to 2019. She holds a bachelor degree in uh, general chemistry, a master degree in organic chemistry, and a doctor of medical degree. Chihombori was a family medicine specialist in Tennessee. She practiced medicine for 29 good years. Oh, 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 oh. this woman is, is very, very learned, okay? She understands her job. So she has been in, in politics. Uh, of Africa for a long time and she understands many many things about the African and the black people. She has been talking about the black community for a long time. If you can remember very well there's a video of her that I did uh, talking about African Americans going to Burkina Faso. In fact she asked Ibrahim Traore to welcome the African Americans in Burkina Faso, okay, because African Americans are our brothers and sisters who went to America during slave trade, the way history states. Now, I want us to watch this video. We will discuss more about what Arikana thinks about the black unity, okay? So let's let me play the clip, guys, then we watch, then come back and discuss. My name is Arikana Chiumbori. I was born in Zimbabwe, some little village called Chivo. Came to this country to go to college on the first degree in general chemistry and a master's in organic chemistry, went on to medical school, uh, then did a residency in general surgery and family medicine, practiced medicine for 25 years until one night. <laughs> Around 3 a.m. 3 a, a phone call comes in and says, uh, Doc, the African Union ambassador to the United States has resigned. She was going to be running for president of her country and that we would want you to be the next African Union ambassador to the United States. Now keep in mind, I am a scientist through and through. So who in their right mind would want me to become an ambassador in Washington? I thought that was a joke and it was laughable. Well, I fought it for about six months, but because being an African, after a while, I had to listen to my elders. So I figured, okay, if you think you're putting a joke on me, the joke is on you, because I'm gonna go, only go to Washington for six months and then I'll come back. And I'll tell my elders that I tried, but I couldn't do it. But something happened during the first four to five months. And mind you, I'm staying in a hotel because I knew I wasn't going to get into a contract renting or buying that I wasn't going to last. <laughs> But what was very disturbing was the disrespect that was so blatant. I would be sitting in meetings initially, because you know, as a doctor, you're always a doctor no matter where you are. 
And I thought it was really quite humorous sitting with all these big diplomats and here I am a medical doctor and I'm supposed to be useful. I'm busy diagnosing them, you know, you got a thyroid condition, you are bipolar and I got a pill for you. <clears throat> I'm not really paying, paying attention to the deliberations because I don't think politicians accomplish much anyway. So, <laughs> so it was more important to diagnose them and their medical conditions. But every now and then somebody will say something and I'm like, wait just a minute, did he just say that? You know? And one particular event, there was a whole team of African ministers and one particular leader of a particular department in Washington started raising their voice and screaming and yelling at them. You Africans, you will never speak with one voice. This document over here is going to be a piece of paper 20 years from now. I said, okay, so we got all the ministers here. Somebody say something. It wasn't my show. I was like third, you know how you sit, you got your team leader, and then according to rank, I was number three. So clearly I wasn't supposed to speak. I waited for those who were supposed to speak, to speak, they did not. More and more of those situations became apparent to me. And I remember five months into my stay in Washington. Right. The abuse is for black people wherever you find us. You know, when, whenever a, a black person is insulted or assaulted okay that is a message that um, all black people need to learn you know these people had got all the audacity to tell dr arikana in the meeting where there are diplomats that you black people you'll never unite you will never unite it means they have known what they've done and therefore they are very sure that black people will never unite guys why can't we prove these people wrong let us unite and prove these guys that actually black people can unite and speak with with one voice we have a very very big problem as black people we have a very very big big problem in africa too africans there are people who have actually woken up and they understand how the game is being played we know how they play this game. We know how their cards are being played. We understand that our leaders are part and parcel of the game. They are also part of the game because these are same same people. Once they are elected and get into power, the first thing that they'll do in their first month, in, in, in fact, their first month in office is to buy themselves very expensive cars for their families, their wives, you know, meaning they feel so special more than the people that have elected them. So for us to do away with this thing or this division that is there in Africa, it means it needs to start from Africa here. It needs to start from Africa, not even from, from, from America, from Africa. It is black people here in Africa that should start speaking with, with one voice by kicking out all these puppets whom we have in Africa as the heads of state. Because they are the same same people who are sitting with these people in the same same meeting. They understand how this game is being played. You know? People like president of Ghana, this president, Nana Akufo Addo, was a good man when he was campaigning. In fact, he, this, every word that was coming from his mouth was all about African unity. How Africans should unite, how we will make Africa great. But once he got into power, he forgot about everything that he spoke about African unity and black people's unity. So the first problem that we have as Africans is our leaders and unity must start from Africa here from Africa not even from the United States from Africa it is us black people here in Africa that need to unite first before even involving the black Americans or the African Americans because here here is home and charity begins at home charity begins at home so let us let's unite here at home first then after uniting and speaking with one voice
Therefore, our brothers and, brothers and sisters who are in other continents will join hands and together will make Africa great. Okay? So let's continue watching. I called home and I said, well, you know what, guys, I'm going to hang around a little bit longer. There were a few, you know what, that needed a good kicking. And that I was going to hang around until they run me out of Dodge. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> the disrespect is not just for the Africans on the continent. The disrespect is for black people around the world. The abuse is not just for Africans on the continent. The abuse is for black people wherever you find us. I'm going to share with you some basic facts. You see, our story is a simple one. Our story is of truth and facts, which are two constants that do not change. And all we need to do is give the world an overdose of our truth and insist on it. As we speak today, I'm going to take you back centuries long before the children of Africa were taken out of Africa as slaves. There was some serious resistance when the occupiers from the West came to Africa, contrary to what some might think. They didn't just give up their children, but the fighting began long before slavery. Come on, stop. Now, she has mentioned a very, very powerful statement there. That struggle in Africa began even before slavery. It means Africans never released their brothers and sisters to Americans as slave willingly. They fought trying to defend it. They fought trying to defend it. I've heard so many comments in some of my videos that Africans sold us to slavery and therefore Africans must uh, ask for forgiveness first. How dare you tell us that? You want us to ask for forgiveness, and we are we also we are also in pain. We lost our brothers and sisters in the hands of slavery. Then it has been manipulated that Africans sold you to slavery, which is no good. Okay, so the problem that we have is how we perceive slavery as Black Americans or as African Americans. We perceive slavery in a very very awkward way, and we must understand that. What we consumed is what is destroying us. We, we consumed the Western education. The Western education is what is also misleading us as far as our history is concerned. There's a professor that once said that for history to be, to be regarded as history or as fact, it must be told by the same same people, not by people who are not part of the history. So I've been seeing many comments from African Americans telling me that you people must ask for forgiveness from us first because you sold us to slavery. It might not be true, by the way, but I'm sure it is not true. Because how can someone sell his own brother or his own sister or his son to someone who, whom he knows how he's going to treat that person? Maybe he's going to kill him. Maybe he's going to kill that person. We were forced. People were beaten up. Fathers were beaten up. Mothers were raped. Children were... If you try to resist that act, you are to be eliminated. So it was not an easy thing as many African Americans think that Africans sold them to slavery the way they do think. It is not that way. Africans fought for it. We actually fought it back. So we resisted it. But it was beyond us because these people came with guns. But we had swords. We fought our level best. Our great great grandparents fought this war. But these people later came with guns. And we never knew that there's something like a gun. Yeah, we never knew that. So that caught many Africans with shock. Something shot and kills. So let us uh, erase this narrative that black people in Africa sold us to slavery. No one can sell his son or his brother to a person who is going to mistreat him or mistreat her. Nobody did that. 
that is something that is being used by these people to create division between black people in Africa and the black people in America. No one can sell his brother or sister to slavery. That is a myth that I will never believe that, okay? I will never believe that. I can't even ask for forgiveness on behalf of our great-grandfathers because he is also my great-grandfather as well as you. So we will never ask for forgiveness because that's a myth of dividing black people in Africa and the black people in America. Let's continue watching this video. And the resistance was those who led them, the majority of them, their heads as we speak today are sitting in jars in Europe. Are you aware of that? Our leaders, our ancestors who fought the wars of resistance, their heads, their remains are sitting in jars throughout Europe. And the same people have the audacity to come to Africa and talk to us about human rights. But what's even more disturbing <clears throat> is that we entertain them and we don't remind them of these skeletons in their closet. As we speak today, the priceless artifacts that they store from all over Africa are sitting in their museums throughout Europe. And when you and I, when we visit Europe, we pay to see what belongs to us. <laughs> evidence of theft, evidence of murder in display, on display, in plain sight. As we speak today, black people are listed as three-fifths of a human being in the US Constitution. As we speak today, the redlining continues. As we speak today, African countries are being made to pay ridiculous interest rates on loans that they should not be paying for. As we speak today, reparations are due. Everybody else has been given reparations, expect us. The question then becomes, what is wrong with this picture? Why aren't you and I standing up and demanding that what is right must be done? I can tell you why. Because no other race would stand for a minute what is being done to us. How long do you think a finger of a British soldier last in Zimbabwe? How long do you think a thumb of a German soldier last in Namibia? Not even a minute. They would storm in, kill hundreds if not thousands of people just to recover that one finger. Why is it that we are unable to come together and speak our truth and demand that what needs to be done must be done? It's because they defeated us where it matters the most, which is the mind. It started with the missionaries in Africa long before slavery. They were sent by the Roman Catholic Church to subdue the Africans, make them believe that when you get slapped, turn the other cheek, and that your riches are in heaven. So by the time they followed with the colonizers to reap and rape Africa, we were already brainwashed. She has mentioned a very, very serious statement here. 
we are defeated only here in our brains and the tool that was used is this bible the bible that was brought to africa the bible the, the same same bible our parents interpret it in a different way the interpretation in a different way altogether okay there's a verse in the bible that, that says that if someone slaps this side turn the other side it means if someone comes to ask for your land give him the land if he wants more give him the other one if someone asks for your child and you have children give him your child if he still wants more add him more children okay so that is what that verse actually tells us so wake up here wake up here make use of your common sense use your brain so well to understand what these people are doing or what they did to us okay what they did to the people here in africa so let's continue watching this video then come back and finalize this video guys i want to leave this video for you guys if you're watching for the first time please subscribe drop your like drop a comment and till we meet again in our next video show we were meant to believe everything african was bad and undesirable and everything european was better And the same brainwashing continued as our children were taken out of Africa enslaved. It continued on the plantations, color gradations, light skinned versus dark skinned, field workers versus kitchen workers. To this day, we suffer from the legacy of slavery and the legacy of colonization. For how long are we going to continue to suffer from this affliction? For it is singularly the reason why we are not able to come together just like other races and nationalities have done in this melting pot that is the United States of America. When you ask for the voices of the Irish Americans loud and clear, Jewish Americans loud and clear, German Americans, Italian Americans, Chinese Americans, Indian Americans, their voices are loud and clear. But when you ask for the voices of us black people, you might as well go to the graveyard because we are missing in action. We were taught, we were brainwashed into not even loving ourselves as individuals, let alone each other. We were taught not to trust one another. We were taught not to believe that my brother can, my sister can, but somebody else who doesn't look like you and I is better. The question I have for all of you, just close your eyes and think about your children, your grandchildren. Is this the world you want to leave behind for them? If the answer is no, then you need to have a serious conversation with the image in the mirror. Because it is the image in the mirror that must change. It is the image in the mirror that must understand that you are sick from this affliction of the legacy of slavery. You are not sick at home. You are not sick in the doctor's waiting room. You are not sick in the hospital ward. You are sick in the intensive care. How long are we going to continue to support other people's agendas? Those who stood up to fight during the civil rights movement, during the Pan-African days in Africa, civil rights in the United States, they were all silenced. We are emerging out of a period of 20 to 30 years where just nothing is going on. We are all fast asleep. When are we going to wake up? Reverend Al Shapton is saying, the time to wake up is now.
reparations now. We know all the companies that benefited from slavery. We have their name. We have the list. They must pay. As we speak, many have pledged their contributions. Guess what's going to happen, my brothers and sisters? Because we are not organized, we will never realize those funds. And they will hide behind, oh, they are disorganized. They don't know what they are doing. I am now going to be asking Reverend Al Sharpton to lead us as we demand those reparations. We need to register a global Pan-African fund that can make sure that we have development in black communities where it belongs. Those funds must be organized. Those funds must be paid for. Reparations for black people now. No more shall we continue to be abused. No more shall they continue to exploit our Africa. What is in Africa is our birthright and we are going home to take it. No more shall we be told Africa is a diseased and dying continent because they are going to Africa in droves and telling you to not go there. So this moment is calling for unity of purpose. And before I leave this platform, I'm going to ask all of you to take a moment. If you love your children, if you love your grandchildren and their future, to have a serious conversation with image in the mirror. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. I thank you. The disrespect African leaders often face from the West can be traced to a combination of historical, economic, and geopolitical factors. Here's an explanation. 1. Colonial legacy and racial bias. Africa's colonial past play a major role in how African leaders are perceived in the West. During the colonial period, European powers ruled African countries through a paternalistic system that promoted the belief that Africans were inferior and incapable of self-governance. 2. Economic dependency and global power. Many African countries remain economically dependent on Western countries and institutions like the IMF and World Bank and former colonial powers. Western nations dominate these financial and political institutions, which influences global decision-making. African leaders often find themselves in weaker negotiating positions, especially when seeking foreign aid, loans, or debt relief. This economic imbalance contributes to a perception that African leaders are subordinate, leading to a lack of respect or even ultra demissiveness in global forums. 3. Political instability and corruption Stereotypes Frequent reports of political instability, corruption, and political governance in some African countries contribute to negative perception of African leaders. Why not all African nations face this issue? They are often generalized to the entire continent. When African leaders are portrayed as corrupt or as authoritarian rulers clinging to power, Western government and media outlets tend to marginalize their voices in international discussions, viewing them as unreliable or untrustworthy. For geopolitical marginalization, in the global political arena, African countries often lack the influence wielded by major Western powers, which further marginalize African leaders. Organizations like the United Nations and the G20 are dominated by Western and global Northern countries. And Africa's role is often peripheral in key decisions about global trade, climate change, and security. Lastly, media portrayal. Western media often shapes perceptions of African leaders by focusing disproportionately on stories of conflict, poverty, and crisis, while underreporting success stories and advancement. This one-dimensional portrayal reinforces the idea that Africa is perpetual in need of help and that its leader were ineffective. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and share your thoughts in the comment box below. Until next time, cheers and have a good one.